Fela Anikula Kutu, the one that would not die, that has the death in his pouch. I have evidence to show you that the person was planted into the community to get him. Many people don't know, but you see, Fela used his money to buy over 5,000. When somebody says, I am a Nigerian, is just trying to say that I am cleverly stupid. And you say you are a Nigerian, you are a fool. What we know about Europe is just a lie. Hi, everyone. The ball's about to drop. Woo -woo! I can't believe it's almost 2020. You're welcome to African Diaspora, African Speak series, stories from around the world. Our very special guest today is an artist, he's a journalist, and he used to be the photographer of the legendary Afrobeat king, Fela Anikola Mukuti. And today he's going to give us an insight on the life of the legendary icon. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. You welcome to the show, Wahibi Lip. Thank you so yeah. much for joining us today. It's a pleasure having you. So, why did you leave Africa? I'm of the generation after the Civil War, Nigerian Biafra Civil War. I saw a lot of a lot of violence. Even though I did not understand what was going on at that time, I saw a, 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 sharp, a sharp degeneration of life before the Civil War. And then soon after the Civil War, there was, there was, there was serious chaos. There, there was a lot of arms within the civil population. And so, soon after the Civil War was when armed robbery started in Nigeria. And the, the area I lived, I was born around the Oju Elegba area. I saw a lot of violence growing up in that place. And then, what I mean was the civil life was, was breaking down and this violent situation was was coming up and without a break. So as a young child, I, I just got asking myself, what, why, why, what is the reason in school? I did not agree with a lot of um, the system of education we had. I knew that there was something wrong with the system of education, even at that age. And then I had, I had a father, my father has passed now, Mr. Freeman Poveni. Can you fix that name? Freeman. Freeman Poveni. So that, that, that actually impressed upon my mind. I am the son of Freeman. Wow. And he was always listening to external services of the BBC and the VOA. You see, and I would say, I mean, to fast forward, that cultivated me into becoming the journalist that I became much later in life. I got my education from, from just listening to, to a wide variety of information all around the world. And then they will be giving us information about our country, and then the the rulers of the country most of the time i was under military rule at this time military will be saying things contrary to what these international uh, media houses were saying yeah. so it was obvious to me that there's there's, there's some contradiction in the polity and the behavior and then the government was an illegal government. It just was clear to me at that age that yeah, there's something wrong here. Yeah. And then 
it's my life. Life is for I to leave. I needed to find find a place where there's peace and, and rest. That's it. Bella was an influential icon and he boldly voiced out his opinions on issues that affected the country. How did that impact you? Well, I was somebody that actually removed the veil from off my eyes for me to see reality. We in that country and I would say the whole of Africa and then even extendedly black man is walking blindfolded and Fela was one man out of, yeah, there you have a few of them. Fela and Bob Marley were the major influences for me. I grew up in a two kilometer radius from his original Kalakuta Republic. The Africa Shrine, the original Kalakuta Republic, which was just on a Gege motor road. I was always hearing him. Whatever latest music came out, I, I, I would hear it before it goes even international and, and that thing. So Fela was a very uh, influential person in my mental evolution. You worked as his photographer. What was he really like, you know, behind the stage? Fela was like a workaholic. Right from when he wakes up, he sleeps late. He sleeps all the morning and then wakes up in the late afternoon. And then soon after he wakes up, he's active and productive. Right from that moment, all around, all around, and everybody around him has to be on the move, on the move. He was a lovely, lovely soul. He loved people. He gave, he gave everything he had. He was a sacrificial lamb to the progressive development of Africa. He gave all, he gave his all. Many people don't know, but you see, Fela used his money to buy over 5,000 copies of How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, a book by Dr. Walter Rodney. And then he would, he would pack up these books and go to the universities and was distributing them to for free, was giving these books out to university students. And, and then looking at it was, was for some enlightenment campaign. Dr. Walter Rodney was killed less than six months after publishing that book. He was assassinated because the book, the book was, was very explicit on how how Europe underdeveloped Africa and and then how they they continue to do it. why Africa is the way we are today. It's it's a concerted plan to make us underdeveloped. You referred to Fela in your article as um, a bombing a strange being. What did you mean by that? We all called him Abami, Abami Eda. Abami Eda is, is a strange, a strange being from his creativity. The, his compositions were way beyond that particular point in time of, of human development. And, and if you realize this is, fella has gone now almost 25 years now, and people are beginning to use beats and pieces of his music and making their songs. Yeah, yeah. You can take just, just his bass line, just his bass line, and you make a big song out of it. Or just, just the piano, piano chunks it makes, you make a song out of it. Or the guitar, the, 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 the saxophone flicks, you make a song out of it. He was beyond, beyond everybody. And then, what? Spiritually, he was, he was elevated. He was, he was a being where. Uh, let me, let me give you just one example. What makes him, what makes him an abam? He, he has a song called C R F J J. Clear Road, 
for Jaga Jaga. <laughs> incredible, incredible music. He was composing that song three months ahead of the government of Sonny Abacha, one of the most brutal dictators we, we ever had. Saturdays was when Fela does, does his uh, rituals at the shrine. They call it the, the comprehensive show. He does his ritual, he's, he's praying to the Orisha and, and things like that. And then after that, that ritual, that particular day, he came on stage and he said, oh, well, that, uh, that the spirits have revealed something intriguing to him. And then that, at that time, we were still in, in the interim government by, by Shonekon. He said that the man that is going to take over the government yeah. is a man with a small stature in this world. Okay. But in the speak but then in the spirit world that he's a giant. He's a giant in the spirit world that he has seen seen him. Yeah. And then the, he said so many other things, but the particular thing is that that let no human being try try to try to dis remove this man from office or displace him from his position because they'll be committing suicide. These are Fela's words. They'll be committing suicide. But at the end of the day, this, this one is very, now, very important now. Now he's saying that, that our ancestors will remove this man like a maggot. And this was all before he came into power? This was all before, before, before Sonia Bacha came to government. Bacha, in the Yoruba language is Abasha. Abasha is rubbish. Rubbish. Abasha. Rubbish. So that's where the Jaga Jaga comes in. Rubbish. And it says clear road. Clear road for him. Clear road. Many people have confused confused that concept of saying, well, Fela was, was Fela had given way and he was supporting uh, the Abacha and all those kind of things. That that was that, that's not that's far from the truth. Yeah. Fela was was steady from from the beginning and up to the end of his life. He did not waver. He couldn't have supported a military government. He was just telling you the 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 obvious situation that was gonna play by. That was it. Yes. Very, very interesting. How did Fela die? Because he was a revolutionary person, he, he was obstructing the desires of some people. He was a threat to the imperialists. The imperialist was the white face with the black hand ruling our people. Yeah. And they now came out to say, well, he died of uh, complications of HIV. Now the question would be, right, right, let's let's go steps behind before that. I have evidence to show you that Fela was warned about this epidemic of, of HIV. He was warned to be careful by somebody, but he just was not paying attention at that moment. So I am saying that an HIV infected person was planted into the community to get him. And then many people wouldn't know that you, you just think it was just Fela that, that died out of that situation. I'm telling you that over a hundred other people died from, from that situation. So it was supposed to cause mass destruction in the Calakuta Republic. Yeah. They made his brother the, the uh, health minister to come and give some speech to say, well, Ophelia died of, of HIV, complications of HIV. 
You see, again, I'm trying to show you that they will use your closest person to work against you in every situation. That's what happened. Yes. That's what happened. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Felan was at his prime. He was at his prime. He was he was speaking the truth to to governments locally, nationally, and even internationally. Mm -hmm. So he had enemies everywhere. That, for me, that was a really sad situation because I lost a legend, I lost a hero at that point, and it was some situation that I, it took me a long time to be able to adjust to, to the lost. I was displaced by that, by that loss of him. And then people will ask the question, so, so why, why is his name uh, Anikula Kokuti? Anikula for the one that would not die, that has the death in his pouch. That's it. that's the meaning of that name, Pela Anikula Kuti. And then he comes to say, well, he would not die and, and, and things like that. But you see, reasoning brings you into knowing that things of this world are beyond literature. It was not saying those things literally. <laughs> he was saying it in terms in terms of dimensional dialectics. Today, as you and I are speaking, I can assure you all around the world, just at this very minute, over a hundred thousand people and conversations are centered on Fela and Nicola Kuti. So and then that, that, that situation it keeps on growing even with time. Many more, many more people are beginning to, to know about him yeah. and to listen to him. So all his likes and dislikes. He never liked to have stupid people around him. <laughs> he was, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, he always wants people, people around him that could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him. One-on-one yeah. -on -one conversation where the intention was to, was to increase the conversation okay. and expand the discussion. He was always recommending that we read books. Okay. Don't, think, don't, think like, don't think like everybody else. Don't, don't tell me what you read from, from the newspapers. Okay. You read the newspaper, but but what is your opinion? Right, right, right. Yeah. Don't don't regurgitate what the paper says. <laughs> it That's, must it must have been challenging, you know. <laughs> all the time with him, you have to be very awake, awake with him, and and you have to be current. That's very important for him. He like he like current affairs. He read he read the newspapers every morning. He didn't wake up in the morning, but. By afternoon, late morning, when he wakes up, he reads through the newspaper. He wants to know what, what is happening, what is today saying to you and to me. And then what, what does he not like? He doesn't like false falsehood, lie, lying tongues, and then drugs. Drugs were something he just did not tolerate. And, and then, yeah, alcohol was, was another. He never took alcohol. He was a very, was a very disciplined person. Discipline, was, discipline was, was second nature to him. And, and he, he had to work within, within that conformity of, of his discipline. It just it, it, it didn't it didn't behave random randomly. No. Let me give you an instance. The first day I met him, close, just this close, I freaked out. <laughs> why? Uh, why? That's why I I call him this Abba Mieda. Within a radius of of him was some transmission of energy so so potent that my 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 camera dropped from my hand <laughs> that much that much oh, my oh yes 
I was trying to take I was trying to take a photograph and I think it, it just it came from behind all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. And, and whoa, whoa, what's this? What's this? And my camera dropped. Oh. <laughs> and then and then he just looked at me, he looked at me, looked at me closely, and then he laughed. He just laughed. He just laughed. He he always has that effect on people, so he wasn't a... <laughs> Possibly, yeah. He had some magnetic presence. It's this African drum that it has something as long as about seven feet long drum. The thing sounds boom, 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 boom. That sound, boom. I've been there when they were playing this thing at the shrine, and it was so hypnotic. This woman sitting, sitting close there. She went into a trance. Wow. She went into a trance and just started to shout and whoa, whoa. And she ripped off all of her clothes. This is what I'm telling you what I saw. And then Fela said, oh, 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 let her be. Just leave her. Just leave her alone. That she has brought a message for him. For him and for us, marijuana is not a drug. Cannabis. Is not a drug. The people that are controlling the earth to the spiritual, they know that marijuana liberates you from their energy. I did not know that. I was just in that thing physically. I have evidence to show to you that Marijuana is a decoder of negative energies. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> it's, 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 not, it's not a drug. Marijuana reveals you to yourself. It opens your mind to see, to, to, to connect with the divine. The African rituals and things, when they used to do the incense and things like that, not only African, even in the South American, that, that's what they used to use for the incense. Incense. And eventually they, they, they had to, they had to um, prohibit the use of it. Why? Because they, they, they found out that they, they cannot control people using it. They cannot deceive them. Rice, your ordinary rice. And marijuana are brothers and sisters. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain it to you. Your brother, your brother takes your, your surname, right? You have you have your brother Emeka Sonny, right. right? Is that correct? Okay, so get this now. Marijuana is cannabis sativa. Rice is oriza sativa. Oh my god! One one authority says use this one and don't use this one. <laughs> oh my god. What's going on? That there was some particular intention for removing that substance from the society. That's what I'm showing you. It was freedom, freedom to learn, freedom to experiment. You are not confined into any space. You had room to think, to suggest. There was freedom. This man was always in, in some mental movement. There's always a movement. Movement, if you know about the planetary movements, the, the solar solar movement, you know, all of those things. He was always making references to, to, to things like that. Even though at, at that time, I, I didn't understand these things. There's a vacuum between the messenger and the audience 
the the audience was just dancing, dancing to to the rhythm, to the music, and we were not attentive to the content of the message. He made he made it very clear that his music was not for what enjoyment just come here and dance and you get you get out his music was something to to open your mind nice, nice. to to shift to shift your your attention from this planetary occurrence into another thing he was he was he was totally a spiritual being. I've never seen him like like he was dozing off or he was looking so tired. That's an incredible, incredible thing for me. In your article, you 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 said that the, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank was working together to deceive Africans. That is a big accusation uh, to me. Totally so. Why? Why did you say that? Collaborate to make it to make it very, very easy for you to to understand is that you see, Africa is the richest continent with all the resources, human and material resources, and then Africans are the poorest people. The economic laws that are emanating from these institutions, the World Bank, IMF, are designed to strangulate Africans even more. The structural adjustment program that was designed in the 80s, 1985, 86. I remember particularly when uh, Ronald Reagan was the president of America. It was around about that time that this structural adjustment program was designed. The, the arrangement was was to value the same uh, structures in New York. The highest in New York were to be evaluated with the same structures in Lagos, Nigeria, or Accra, Ghana, or anywhere else in Africa. The same. You were trying to put them. On the same value system, which was which was in itself a flawed economic system. That was the that was the time they designed to ruin the African economies. And I'm telling you, go, go search for it, and you find out that was at that time naira, the Nigerian currency, was just what uh, about one naira to one dollar or at the most five naira to one dollar but soon after that situation it dropped so hard that it now became 50 naira to one dollar structural adjustment is suck african people s-a-p Squeeze African people, structural adjustment program designed to, to confuse our people the more, to traumatize Africans, to keep us to keep us in the position of disadvantage regularly and then continuously. Unfortunately, we don't realize those things. And then the 
messengers, our leaders like Fela, like Bob Marley, like Honorable Marcus Mosiah Gavi, Malcolm X, and today we still have Honorable Louis Farrakhan shouting, shouting down on in our faces to wake, to wake the black man up. Wake up, black man, wake up. Wake up, you're in a slumber, wake up. We're the only race that does not realize that we're in a war. And we're just putting lipsticks and, and trying to dance, shake a dance and all those booty dances you're dancing. Just foolishness and, and, and we don't even realize it. And we, we think they're praising us. They think they're praising, they're praising us. Whereas they're just looking at you and say, oh, look at, look at, look at the bomb clap. Slavery, colonialism, and then neocolonialism were these instruments they used to oppress the black man's mind. Yes. You said in your article that it, it needs to be addressed. So how, how can we address We need to change the manner of thinking. We need we need to we need to know who we are. For instance, everything that is happening in the Vatican City and the Pope of Rome of today is a photocopy of what happened in, in Egypt, ancient Egypt. And they, they turn the table round for us and they're serving us like like we are, <laughs> oh my God, yes, yes. Fela was telling us then, and at that time I said, wow, this man, this man is crazy. What is he talking about? He, he, he'll just get into some, some friends. Hey, my, my brother, my brother, my brother, beg, 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 my brother, go read books, man, go read books. He was recommending even the books for us to read. The Black Man of Denial, that was one book he recommended. How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Malcolm X's autobiography was the only book I brought from Africa when I was living in Africa. I had to know, I had to know, what was, who, who, who was Malcolm X and why was he the way he is? Who was Malcolm X? Painted a picture like he was, he was a radical, he was a racist, he wanted to kill white people. If you don't, if you don't know him, how can you judge him? So for that same reason, I had to get the book. I had to read it and I found, I found a different man in Malcolm X. Malcolm X is my teacher. Malcolm X is my mentor. I'm a disciple of Malcolm X. God knows and I'll tell even my pastor that. See what I'm saying? You see, if I don't speak for my race, who speaks for them? That's what we're talking about. That don't make that that don't make me a racist. That only makes me concerned about my people. You see, black man, black man is the same here in in New York. It's the same there in in New Jersey. The same there in anywhere in Africa. We're the same black people, but they're just twisting us against them. Plus, if you look at it. Only up to recently, there was a concerted effort to keep African diaspora separate from motherland Africa. Yeah. Unfortunately for them, unfortunately for us, that 
separation is beginning to break down. It's beginning to break down. We're beginning to see, see the need for us to, to come together. Africa unites. That's what Marcus Gavi said. We, we need our unity to organize ourselves. Th this civilization is built upon our sweat, our energy. It's built upon our ingenuity, yet they treat us like we're stupid. Fela did not need to do what he, was, what he did. He was from a home where he was, he was, he was comfortable by himself. He didn't, need, he didn't need to fight for you. He didn't need to fight for me. I founded the Radio Zeta Club on the 15th of October, 1987. The same day Captain Thomas Sankara was murdered. And that same day was Fela's birthday. At a very early age, I realized that there was no connect between what they were teaching us in school with our reality on ground in Africa. That's why I feel I said, teacher, don't teach me nonsense. <laughs> My teacher was teaching me nonsense. That the teacher was a fool. My teacher, the same black man, was telling me that, that Mongo Park discovered River Niger. Mongo Park was a Scottish man. He will come to to discover River Niger in, in Africa. The country, Nigeria, the way it is today, cannot go forward. It's not possible. It's not possible. It's, it's, it's a, a country that is mixed up in deception. The name Nigeria is an insult. And when somebody says, I am a Nigerian, it's just trying to say that I am cleverly stupid. And you say you are a Nigerian, you are a fool. The prefix Niger, Nigeria. My question to you, Niger, in what language is that word from? Not an African language. It's not an African, it's neither Igbo, neither Yoruba, nor Hausa, nor, nor Swahili. It's not an African language. When you tell a black American that he's a nigger, what is his reaction? They will punch you in the face. Thank you very much. They'll punch you to your face because, because, because of why? Because that word, that word is, is even aggressive. Niger, by my investigation, is the German equivalent for a nigger, for the American nigger. And then they now say you are Nigeria. It was a white woman that came with that word, Flora Shaw, who became Flora Lugard. Frederick Lugard, Lugard's wife gave us gave gave that country that name would you allow your enemy to subscribe a name for your child no. never nigeria and we don't know that this woman was just laughing at your face and say oh look at look at look at the collection of idiots nigerians nigger area that's what he's trying to say that's what, that's what she was trying to say we never, we never had a leader in Nigeria right from independence to today. We just had rulers. Chief Obafemi Awolowo was a leader. General Emeka Odumegwojuku, that was a leader. General Mortala Mohammed was a leader. All these other people give you have now are just rulers. Ruler does not know what to do with even the biggest resources available to them. Nigeria is just, is just a mix of nigger area, stupid people. It's an insult. 
the, our leaders still, still cannot understand that almost 60 years after. The reason for, for Radio Center Club was this. About a week, a week before this, I had read in a French newspaper that interviewed Captain Thomas Sankara. And specifically, the paper says that we have information that there is a coup in planning against you. And the man planning the coup is his friend, Captain Blaise Campore. What do you have to say about that? Thomas Sankara's response was very direct. If it is Blaise Campore planning a coup against me, nobody can save me from it. Nobody can save me from it. That man knows me more than anybody. About seven days later, I was just by my window. I was in my second year in the, in the University of Port Harcourt. I always had my shortwave radio. Shortwave radio is the godfather of the internet of today. With, with shortwave radio, we connected with the whole world. We listened to BBC. That news came, like hitting me like a big ball in my head. Wow. Captain Thomas Sankara has been, has been murdered. It was at that moment I cried so hardly. Yeah. And then just soon after that, this name came up to my mind, Radio Zeta Club. The idea was people sitting by the radio to obtain information. Well, I have members all over the world, over 10,000 members all over the world today. And then I used it to change to change the lives of many people. I have um, testimonies from far and wide with incredible stories. A young man that came to meet me, he had to travel from Benin to meet me in Lagos. And he said when he met me, I was in a hurry trying to go out, and but then that I spent some some time with him say about 30 minutes change his whole life that man today is a professor of computer science i'm a coach i'm a mentor an english teacher a musician and a whole lot of other things where the theory of the three e's plus e is equal to E. There's entertainment, education, encouragement, empowerment, all equals to excellence. The entertainment part is where I, I entertain you to, to shake and shift your mind from that baggage that you that you are carrying. For you to drop the baggage and come into my environment. Education, access to information is your access to education, encouragement. Encouragement is that position where, wow, you, you, you are almost overwhelmed by, by these new things coming at you. Wow, what's going on? Whoa, wow, wow, wow. And I say, oh, listen, 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 relax, relax. Yes, you can. The empowerment, assuming having consumed this information, and you start you start bringing it out by yourself. You start regurgitating what you have learned. And then all of it now becomes excellence. I had some, had about six songs that, that were never recorded. And unfortunately for, for people like you, you may never, you may never hear those songs. The older fella was getting, the more complex his compositions were becoming. Were you with him till he died? Yes. What were his um, final days like? Well, final days now, when he became very sick, he, he was mostly confined in, into his room. He wasn't coming out again. He wasn't speaking to anybody. He refused to to eat. He just went down, 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 down. 
yeah, refused to eat, refused to see people. And then he was getting so bad up, up until the, oh, what about a week? Before he died was when, when, and then that's what I'm saying. You see, it was a conspiracy to 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 kill him. Where at that particular moment, his brother, Bekor and some Kuti, was the only doctor that he permitted to have access to him. Bekor and some Kuti was in jail. So there was, there was no medical treatment. And by the time they took him out from the house, he, he, he didn't stay. Well, even the doctor said he was going to be, what, less than 48 hours, but my fella stayed what, about another six days before he gave up. It was a sad situation, yeah. Sad to, to know that a man will give himself to his people, and then yet they, they, they did not appreciate him at all. I have some young people with my radio zeta club in places all over the world. A young man who is a member of the radio zeta club, Olayinka Shakabula, were designing a project and a program where we call it the African Chess School. ACS, okay. African Chess School. The idea here is to use the philosophy behind the game of chess to reorientate our people, to re-educate our people, to re-enlighten our people. We are, we are the strong ones, we are the strong race, but we don't know nothing about ourselves. I did not know I did not know nothing about Africa until I came out of Africa. Sandra Isador, the woman that revolutionized the mind of Fela and Nicola Kokuti, as an African American woman, yes, who met Fela when Fela was young, 1969. She saw the the innocence of this strong-minded individual who was acting in reverse to his his own progress he was at man uh, admiring the americans and this woman told told him to say hey listen stop, stop that look at this look at this and look at that information about africa is better accessible in America than in Africa itself. The kind of education they gave to us messed up our minds. I was refused to speak my language in school by even a black teacher. They called my African language vernacular. Vernacular comes from, from even <laughs> a Spanish word which means rubbish. If our leaders could hear you right now, what would you what would you say to them? So considering all the, the wealth of knowledge that you have and what is the way forward? They don't they don't come into the definition of, of a leader. These are hooligans. The one leader I see standing for today is the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame. Paul Kagame has proven imperialist system that we're not we're not a stupid race in less than 25 years he has moved rwanda from a genocide country into a progressing country the way forward is is reorientation reorientation of our people to make us know the greatness that is innate in us. International Society for Individual Liberty is, is a human rights organization based in, in the US. So you went on a scholarship to France? I moved over to, to France on a scholarship. 
I lived in France for a while in Paris and I moved over to Spain. The white people are evolving from homo sapien to homo luminous. The black man is degenerating from homo sapien to homo erectus. Using the, the, the context of Nigeria in which Nigeria exists today, it's just a total example of that. Robbery, ritual killing, even to the to the little thing as mosquito. You to, to just take your mind back to when humanity, when we were in the caves, minimum of 65% of your mental strength was engaged in self-preservation to keep you alive from these predators. Fast forward to today, life-threatening situation. Your mental strength, instead of thinking about progress and prosperity, they're thinking about self-preservation. 60% of your mental strength is actually thinking about how to preserve yourself. Over 150 million people in that degenerated state of, of livelihood. What I mean by that, yeah, homo luminous, homo sapien, homo erectus. How is life Barcelona? Barcelona is a beautiful place. If I'm, 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 I'm shocking from, look at that, at Barcelona. <laughs> yes, it's a lovely place. One of the best places you, you can be in Europe. Because when the weather is good, the okay. people are friendly. As an African living in, in Europe, African Europeans. What do I like about this place? You see, it's, it's a peaceful peace of mind that exists here. Even the, the, the president of your country does not have it. What do you do for a living? I'm a, a coach, certified human resource coach, um, an intercultural mediator. I'm an English teacher. I teach, I teach English to Spanish people, and then I teach Spanish to English people. Uh, I, I'm a musician. Listen to your music. What's, um, how would they reach you? On YouTube? And on YouTube, on YouTube, on YouTube, just put YouTube, Eddie Rocksteady, Eddie, Eddie Rocksteady, Eddie Rocksteady. If an African wanted to come to Barcelona. To a different culture. I was in a cultural shock for, for, for a long time. What we know about Europe is just a lie. <laughs> reality, the reality hits you on the face right from the airport. You have to be ready, ready to learn the language for you to adapt to them, not them adapting to you. The carpenter, the, the shoemaker, the mechanic, those are the people that are making money here. If you could do it all over again, would you leave Africa? I would actually leave much earlier than I did leave if, if I... Yeah. <laughs> Let me let me let me give you and then you can you can please check this out. It is the government that is making sure that you don't have light. There's there's some something written in your NEPA NEPA edict or something yeah. that you can that you cannot transmit electric power from one place to the other. Really? It, it is actually a crime. The neighboring countries, uh, is it Benin Republic, uh, Niger, and even Togo, I think, Nigeria has given them 24-hour light, and really? we don't have light. Yes. Verify, please. Don't believe what I'm telling you. Verify. So, so you know, you know that it, it must be a twisted, minded person that will be acting 
like this. You are the scriptwriter and the co-director of this movie, the movie of your life. Your story is a unique one. Be wise and prudent enough to tell it as it is. Shout out to anyone? Shout out to, to, for, to many people. My teachers, I have teachers, uh, Debbie Dashinga, Dr. Joanne Cartwright, Dr. Heather Anderson Hill, Honorable Louis Farrakhan, that's a great man. Dr. Omar Johnson. Well, there are so many people, my Radio Zeta Club members, yeah, my uh, African Chess School members, everybody that has the progress and prosperity of the black man in his heart. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching.